<laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, this you is never uh, listen to me. <laughs> never listen to him. This is Richard Hall here from uh, <laughs> from Stonehenge Artillery, and uh, this is the night sky. Of course, as usual, I'm escorted by uh, Kay. Say hello, Kay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy over there. Yeah, I'm the other yeah, guy. Keith Austin, yeah. yeah. Keith okay. Austin. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the night sky. If the weather cha changes markedly from where it is at the moment, maybe you'll be out, go out and see some of the things that we're we'll going to be showing you right now. So let's start off by looking to the south, all right? Around about 10 o'clock in the evening, once it's got really dark, and at this time of the year, the Southern Cross reaches its lowest point in the sky, all right? And the Milky Way, because the Southern Cross is in the Milky Way, lays along the horizon. So we've lost that magnificent uh, Milky Way vin uh, visage that we used to have earlier on in the year. OK, and of course, following behind uh, the Southern Cross are the two pointer stars. And the brightest of those, of course, is Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star beyond the solar system. In the west and setting in the west is the scorpion, all right? And the scorpion was, is our sign of winter. So while the scorpion dominates the sky, um, it's cold and nasty, okay? You can just see the, the, the Antares there, which is the heart of the scorpion, which has definitely got a definite orange colour to it. It's a super giant star. And then go, turning around to the east, we've got Orion, which is our sign for the summer, uh, rising up in the east there. Of course, in the northern hemisphere, it's completely opposite from where I came from. Uh, Orion was the winter sign. If you wanted to explore Orion, you had to go out in the coldest of English winters. And also we've got, towards the east, the two brightest stars in the sky. And these are Sirius and Canopus. Any star-like object that's brighter than these is no star, okay? It'll be a planet or something like that. And looking above, also now reaching its highest point in the sky, are the two Magellanic clouds, the large cloud and the small cloud. And to the unaided eye, they look like detached portions of the Milky Way, but they are in fact satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Um, just like the uh, planets have got moons, so the big galaxies like ours also have uh, companions or, which orbit around them. And eventually, with the passage of time, probably get simulated into the Milky Way. Okay, so the largest of the large Magellanic Cloud, uh, its distance is 158,000 light years. All right? So it tells you some distance away. And it contains something in the region of 30 billion stars. Now, to put this on scale, in our Milky Way galaxy, we've got something like oh, well over 200 a billion stars in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. And it's going across a large area of its 32,000 light years across. And so it's a, it's a spectacular object that can be explored even just with a pair of binoculars. All right? So this is a satellite galaxy. Yes, it's um, quite a spectacular view through a small telescope. Um, a good telescope will pick out the individual stars and you can see some of the nebulosity in the um, LMC, the large Magellanic yeah. cloud as well. Well, for those of you looking at this on TV, you can see down to the bottom left can corner of the Magellanic cloud, there's a sort of pinkish bright spot region. That is actually what we call the Tarantula Nebula. Yes. There it is there. And it is one of the most massive star forming regions in the entire uh, this region of space, shall we say, Milky Way as well. It's absolutely enormous. Right? And what we've got in the Tarantula Nebula, it's, it's just there, there's a diameter of just over 1800 light years. And it's a gas and dust cloud which is illuminated by giant stars which had <laughs> just formed within it. But it is an absolutely massive star forming region. We're bringing you up the central region of the Tarantula coming up now. And there it is there. Look at those stars in there. All right. They, uh, st these they, are Hubble. Uh, these Hubble oh, the, telescopes. Oh, yeah, you're not going to see it like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you've got used to the Hubble telescope. You've got a mixture of, of images there, though. They're not all in visible light, like the Hubble. Some of them are in 
infrared mm. and things. Mm. Yeah. 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 Most of the ones I use, I always try to get visual things yeah. that we can see. Yeah. But that's why they look different. Yeah. Sometimes you're looking at the same bit, but it looks very different yeah. because they're looking at a different light spectrum. Yeah. Yes. Now, the, near the centre of the tarantula is some of the brightest stars. Now, we've got one or two of them over a million times brighter than the sun. And the cluster has got a mass which we've made of 450,000 times that of the sun. So we've got a, cl a gigantic cluster here. And what we believe, or what astronomers now believe is actually happening here, is it's a forming globular cluster. Yes. And that's yeah. what we think is happening. Now, we'll have a look at a, a, a globular, most of the globular clusters we can see in our galaxy. Mm. Ancient, they have formed at the very early stages of the formation of our Milky Way galaxy, and we'll be showing you one a little bit later on. Yeah, okay. what, what is a globular cluster, Richard? Tell us what, uh, briefly, what is, what is that? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's globular in size. Instead of being just a... a uh, a naturally forming cluster. It consists of a huge mass which is spherical in size. I'll be showing you one of these fairly shortly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a well and truly overgrown star cluster. Yeah, okay. The, the normal <laughs> star clusters formed in, in our Milky Way galaxy are what we call open clusters and they consist of things similar to the mm. uh, Matariki of the Pleiades and things like That's that. That's because the gravitational pull on that globular forming globular cluster would be so great it can hold a lot more. Oh, yeah, we're dealing with a mass mm -hmm. far And it's beyond. young because yeah. you were talking about very massive stars that are still yeah, shining, right. yeah. not changing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a massive star forming region. And the wonderful thing about it is you can explore a lot of this with telescopes from here in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd like to point out to you, the Northern Hemisphere, you cannot see the large Magellanic cloud. Yes. And I can remember when I first came out here, that's one of the first things I actually wanted to have a look at for a telescope here. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's one of the first objects that I viewed through the little refracting telescope I had when I was a kid. Mm. And I could just see the nebulosity of the mm. terrestrial nebula that, mm. you, that you were pointing out. And it was amazing to me to see, it's almost like to see for, you know, for real, this enormous star forming region in a galaxy mm. other, uh, other than ours, in a galaxy outside our own Milky yeah. Way. Yeah. And I just got this incredible sense of the of the vast distance mm. that I was seeing through my yeah. through my yeah. little telescope. Look, we're, my we're still learning a lot about these things at the moment. Yes. We really are. Okay. Now nearby we've got the small Magellanic cloud, all right? And it's actually the more distance of the two. It's over two hundred and three thousand light years away. And um, it contains about three billion stars. But the interesting thing about the small Magellanic cloud, astronomers are now suggesting that we're not looking at one galaxy, but two. What we see as a single galaxy, which we call the SMC, is in fact two small galaxies, one laying slightly in front of the other. All right? So what we see is like looking on at the tail of that is actually another galaxy altogether. So we're looking through the galaxy in the front. Yeah. To see the one behind yeah, it. Well, yeah, there's one, one's up to just to one side. Yeah. So the upper part, if you like, virtually divide it in half, one is one galaxy, one's the other. They'd be yeah. fairly close together, but the the what they discover with the large telescopes looking at the motions of the stars mm. and that sort of thing is they do appear to be in separate groups. Yeah. So there you are, so a second galaxy there. Right. So in other words, our Milky Way is being orbited by not two, but three yeah. satellite galaxies. Oh, three that we, there are others as well, of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. And some of which we cannot see because they're on the other side of the Milky Way and so it's on. It's just interesting that you've got a globular cluster just to the top and right of that Magellanic cloud there, so you can actually see. That's exactly what I was going to say. Wouldn't be so young, would it? No, no, no. That, It'd be one of the old ones that's that's around the Milky well, when, Way. When when you see it first of all, when you look for, like through a pair of binoculars, you can see it. Uh, this thing's called Forty Seven Tucane, and the reason why it's called Forty Seven Tucane is that we're looking in the the small Magellanic cloud is in the constellation of the Toucan, right? Yes. And for, that 
originally when this thing was seen it looks like a star so it was called it was a 47th brightest star in the constellation yeah right? of two of, yeah. uh, of the token yeah yes. but of course it's not a star at all it's a globular cluster yep. remember what we said about the in the large one genetic cloud there was a forming globular cluster well we've got that with 47 tucani and i tell you what in a telescope this is the most awesome object to actually look at so there is there it's 47 tucani we'll bring up have a slightly bigger picture of it now this is in yeah. our own galaxy yeah. yeah right that's right yes. and, but it's this object's got um an age uh, going back um, maybe 10 billion years or more, all right? And it's got so many more sort of reddish and, you know, um, bronzy looking stars. That's right. Yeah, all the big mm. blue stars are gone. But as time goes on, smaller stars, a smaller mass, even though similar in mass to the, our sun, are turning into what we call red giants. They expand mm. in size. And that's why you can see a yes. numerous red reddish giants. stars around it. Red giants are just... Basically, ordinary uh, run-of-the-mill stars that are run, they've run, starting to run out of fuel, and as a result, they dim and they expand mm -hmm. into the, a huge red parody of itself. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't yeah. see that when you mm -hmm. were looking at um, when you were looking at the forming glo globular cluster. You couldn't see those colours. No, no, because no. it was too young to be to doing. To be that. having all red, mm. the red stars there, yeah. and also you see, well, whereas you look at forty-seven to Carnay and the small cloud, they look like they're close together. Remember, I said that the small cloud was over two hundred thousand light years away. Uh, well, forty-seven to Carnay is only thirteen thousand and fifty light years away. Mm. I've said only; that's still a hell of a long way. Yes. But it's it's much much closer than the other object. As you, and as you can imagine, if it was placed at the same distance, it would be quite small. If it was the same distance as the small right. cloud, yeah. yeah. So, so those and these objects are the highest in the sky. All right, most people don't have telescopes, but if you've got a pair of binoculars, grab out and see what you can see on a good dark night. I say good dark night, pick something well, it's well away from when we've got a, a full moon and that sort of thing. Okay. Now, when we, when we turn around to the north, on the other hand, we're looking away from the Milky Way. And due north, of course, is the, the, the Great Square. It's made up of four relatively bright stars. It's just that they're not very bright stars, but they stand out and the pattern is quite easy to see. This is the Great Square there. And the brightest object in the sky, that's the planet Jupiter that you can see, all right? Mm. Yeah, and which is the, the largest planet in the solar system. Well, now we're going to be talking more about Jupiter later on in the program. But let's have a look at what else we've got in the sky. Below Jupiter, and just rising up in the east, is the Pleiades star cluster, which we call Matariki. It's 444 light years away, has a diameter of 35 light years, and contains at least a thousand stars so we too often talk, call this the seven sisters because there's a between between five and nine stars that can be seen with the unaided eye right yes. but there we're only seeing the brightest because when a cluster's formed all the stars are formed at the same time now the vast majority are smaller mass stars you don't notice those all we're seeing is the big bright blue hot giant stars there right so that's the seven sisters and we'll have a much much closer look at Matariki later on when it gets a little bit higher in the sky mm. so there's the Pleiades there okay and dropping down to the horizon here the other bright star is all Deberan right uh, and that old Deborah is indeed uh, an actual red giant, right? There it is there. And it's uh, so 65 light years away. Right? And it's 425 times brighter than the sun. But its mass is only 1.7 times that of the sun. Now, normally yes. a star of that brightness would be nowhere near this luminosity. And it's one of these stars that once a time, one of the time was a white star and it's now evolved into a red giant there yes. that's what i was talking about earlier on it's an ordinary run of the mill star and it's starting to run out of fuel mm. and when a star runs out of fuel that's what it does mm. it becomes 
Well, as a contrast, yes. yeah, looking across the others towards the west, we see Altair. Now, Altair, on the other hand, it, its its distance is just under 17 light years, and um, it's got a mass of 1.8 that of the sun, which is very very similar to Aldebaran, right? But its diameter is only 1.8 times that of the sun, and it's only just under 11 times brighter, right? And it's it's got a an oblate, sh blo oblate, sh oblate shape because <laughs> it's a football shape. <laughs> yeah, it's spinning so rapidly; it's almost like a, a, a disc. But then you look at Aldebaran, which is on the screen as well, right? And its diameter is forty-four times out of the sun now, but it's got roughly the same mass. So once upon a time, not too long ago, Aldebaran was very similar to Altair. And it's now turned into this red giant. Now, looking at the two pictures, of course, which are artist impressions, you can't judge the sizes of the stars from that. Remember, the diameter of of uh, Altair is 1.8, while the diameter of uh, Aldebaran is 44. Okay, so yeah, so, but that's what Altair uh, is going to turn into. Also, notice that Altair is a lot closer. Mm. Than that. And so when Not it does turn in red, it will certainly notice it to become one of the brightest stars in the sky, right? So there's the big bright stars up there. And down near the horizon, right, we've got one of the most famous objects in the sky. You can see it with the unaided eye, but most people will need a pair of binoculars. It's just beneath the great square. That's M31, the great galaxy and Andromeda, right? And there it is, its distance is two and a half million light years, right? And it's a galaxy, it's a little bit bigger than our galaxy. Its diameter is 220,000 light years, and it contains a trillion stars, right? So that's M31. And nearby, and you only see this with binoculars, is M33. Right? And that contains the great galaxy in Triangulum. Right, which is a little bit more distant, but a smaller. It's smaller than our Milky Way galaxy, with a diameter of sixty thousand light years, but it still contains fifty billion stars. Right, and these three, they, these two galaxies, along with the Milky Way, make up the three big galaxies of what we call the local group. They're like a, we're all in the same cluster, as it yes. were, in the, in the galaxy. There's, there's hundreds of other smaller galaxies like the LMC and so on, right? but they're not those. These are the big, big galaxies we those, can see. Those there. are the three big ones, though. The Milky Way, Andromeda, and, uh, or M31, and M33. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And it's, they're called M31 and M33 because it's named after uh, astronomer Messier, yes. and it's in his catalogue of nebulous objects in the sky. And this, one was number 31 and the other one was number 33. Wasn't list. the poor fellow looking for comets and these were marked as not comets? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was annoying. He was <laughs> looking so he, for so comets. So he wouldn't get confused. <laughs> yes. I that's always what, remember oh. it because his name sa sounds like Messi yeah. and he obviously <laughs> thought they were Messi. I can imagine him going, oh, no, it's another one of those galaxies. But then, of course... He didn't know they were galaxies. Exactly. He didn't actually know they were galaxies. He does to him, they were messy just, things out there. Yeah. They were just... Not nebulous comments. objects. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, uh, we're, we're going to have a look at Jupiter now. But before we do that, because uh, Jupiter was at its closest point to this to the Sun um, on November the third, okay, which is of course is one of the most important dates in the uh, calendar, isn't it? What are you? <laughs> 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 it happens to be my birthday, folks. <laughs> Uh, Jupiter was closest to the Earth at that particular time, and therefore it's brightest, right? And of course, when the, uh, the the two come to their closest points, that's a damn good time to uh, have a look. Anyway, yes. Keith's going to play us a quick tune uh, to Jupiter, right? yeah. and uh, then we'll go and have a look in detail.
Thank you, Keith. Right, now, back to Jupiter. All right. It's an awesome planet. All right. uh, at, on the November the 3rd, for example, or its current distance, actually, rather, is 595 million kilometres. Um, it sounds a long, long, great distance, but it's very small compared with the stars. Uh, it's actually measured in time is in, in is 33 light minutes. So when you see Jupiter, especially for a telescope, you're seeing it as it was half an hour ago. Right? Yes. You always got to remember this as you look up into space. Now, uh, those um, now all the space probes and so forth that we've sent to Jupiter, when you think of it, uh, they're sending information back. Uh, via radio waves, of course. And radio waves, um, travelling at the speed of light, take um, half an hour to get from Jupiter to us. Mm. So even then, we're not seeing Jupiter as it is now, yeah. but as it was half an yeah, hour. Yeah, but uh, is it, more technically also, when you're trying to steer a spacecraft, yes. you have to pre-program it because you can't say, so, uh, look, this is coming, <laughs> you've already hit it by the time you realise it takes a half an hour, ha half an hour for the me message to reach you that something's approaching you, and if you say turn around, it takes another half hour to yes. get the message back, can you, it's an can hour you imagine difference. Driving a, driving a car like that, you turn the steering wheel, <laughs> and half an hour later the car responds, and uh, so this is why the spacecraft have to be yeah. somewhat yeah. Uh, autonomous and able to make their own decisions. Yeah, yes. so, yeah. yeah. Now what I've just brought out now, flying in, was is the Earth to scale. Just see how big the Jupiter is, the biggest planet in the solar system compared with the Earth, all right? Um, the diameter of, of Jupiter is uh, just under 140,000 kilometres and it has a mass equal to 318 Earths, all right? So this is a colossal world, it really is. And what you can see down, for those who lost it on TV, that were most no noticeable, is the great red spot. And as you can see, it's about the same size as the Earth. But what this is, we're not seeing the surface of Jupiter. All we're seeing is the top cloud layers. Mm. And what you're looking at, the great red spot, is a, a massive cyclone that's taking place there. A storm the size of the Earth. It's been raging for at least 150 years. Right? We have a closer look at that. There it is there. And just to make keep uh, things to scale, I'll brief, bring Earth alongside, OK? Yes. So, yeah, and, and indeed, if viewed through a telescope, you see that the features on the, the planet are slowly changing. Of course, what we're seeing is changes in cloud layers and so on. Now, have a, having a closer look at those bands that we can see, all right, what we do know is the brown bands that you can see on your are higher clouds, all right, they're much higher. Mm. The white ones, you're, you're looking deeper down, maybe several hundred kilometres deeper down into the surface of Jupiter. Well, if you were to take a journey into Jupiter down through those clouds, all right, eventually it would get darker and darker as you went down. So let's imagine it was travelling down through the clouds. And incidentally, there's continuous, as you can imagine, continuous storms. Remember, Jupiter rotates on its axis in about 10 hours. Yes. That's why it's got that flattened shape. And the, the turbulence in the clouds is absolutely enormous. So great power of, of uh, lightning strikes. Then as you go down beneath the clouds, and you go into total darkness. And eventually, as you go down, you will reach an, reach an ocean. But not an ocean of water. This is an ocean of liquid hydrogen and methane and so on. Right? Yes. And by that time, incidentally, the pressure is so great that no known solid can exist. And what would happen is your little spacecraft will crumple away. Right? So this is hydrogen and methane that has been rendered liquid not by cold temperature, but by the tremendous pressure of the outer layers of Jupiter. Well, indeed. Yes. I mean, the outer layers of Jupiter are, you know, 100 plus degrees below zero. But as you go in, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And by the time you get to this ocean, it'll be yes. quite warm down. But as you say, that is just due to the You're pressure. showing a lightning strike there. Why doesn't the methane explode? There's it's no oxygen. No oxygen. <laughs> ah, well, there we are. Because everybody's going to ask. I mean, methane's <laughs> highly explosive. Yeah. But it's right. You've got to have oxygen. You know, Hydrogen is yeah. too, because we all know the Hindenburg got into trouble. That's yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, there's now, we now know that Jupiter's got at least 
95 moons all right now most of these moons are little fellows uh, like this thing here uh, like asteroids and in fact psyche which we're just showing you on tv it's, got a couple it, of black eyes. it's not one of the moons it's actually an asteroid but it's i'm just putting it's this a captured up. asteroid yeah yes i'm i'm showing you what 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 these smaller moons look like right so yeah. we've got these 95 moons but three of them are on the scale of planets terrestrial planets all right and these are called the galilean moons because they were discovered by galileo when he turned his telescope towards them okay and but and we always used to think because there are moons they'd be a little bit like the our moon but tell you what folks the most extraordinary worlds and we don't have much time left we can always have a look at these later uh, at the next program but each of these worlds is absolutely magnificent and weird and wonderful mm. here we see them here okay so let's start off by looking at first of all io right this is the most volcanically active world in the solar system there's always at least three volcanoes erupting at any one time and its entire surface is resurfaced in a matter of centuries mm. right as a result the, yeah. the, the the surface of io always looks like a pizza that's been uh, oh, uh, left yes. out for, for three yeah. weeks it's <laughs> absolutely right you wouldn't want to it has a strange look to it you wouldn't last very long yes. on that surface of that world okay and next after we'll move it along quite fast next beyond that is europa and that's the dead opposite this is a world of ice so what we're looking at a world covered in ice we have a look a closer look at that and it's but it's got these cr crisscrossings around and so on cracks in its surface they look like antarctica at the yeah, moment that's right mm. and you can see for those of you looking you can see all that brown brown coloring now let me tell you something that's organic material yes now i'm not saying it's life but i say it's organic material the precursor yeah and yes. um, what scientists are saying if we're going to find life anywhere else in the in the solar system beyond the earth it will probably be on europa and they want to send a spacecraft to Europa yes. and bore down through the ice and have a look and find out what's I underneath. I believe it's in the planning stage at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, in Antarctica, the cracks are caused by the fact that the water is moving underneath. So there's something Tight. moving, something yeah. liquid may be moving underneath oh, yeah, or a slush. Yeah. It's certainly it's water under and, and of course, it, the, the interiors of these things like Io is so hot, it's because of the gravitational uh, tidal effect of Jupiter. It's yeah, in, and so it's instead of volcanoes, thing. it's now yeah. ramped down a little That's bit right. to yeah. Yeah. moving. Yeah. Then quick, I'll be a little quickly move for the others. Then we've got Ganymede, which is the biggest moon in the solar system. It's like it's it's also water the surface, but it's as hard and as dry as glass. Mm. Right. So it's a glass planet. Yeah. Lots of craters. Yeah. And then finally, we got looking here. We got uh, Callisto, oh, yes. right? And that's that one there. And when it'll come up and even more craters. it has got more craters on its surface than any other world in the solar system okay and one of the clues about craters isn't is that if you don't see any craters the surface is being resurfaced all the time by something and if you see an awful lot of craters that means it's an old surface anyway we've got to leave now jupiter's also got rings just to say that stonehenge is open uh, from 10 a.m to 4 p.m wednesday to sunday and if you want to see the stars we also do star evenings but you have to give us a call and book that so having said that good night and we'll catch up with you in two weeks time